one. You will hear a conversation between a man and a researcher. First, you have some time to look at questions one to ten. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Section 1 Good morning, sir. Are you enjoying the Perfect Home exhibition? Yes, I am. It's very interesting. I'm planning on buying a home in the near future and this exhibition has given me some great ideas. I'm conducting a survey on behalf of the exhibition organisers. Can I take a few minutes of your time to ask you some questions? Yes, of course. Can we sit down? I'm rather tired after walking around the different exhibits and stands. Of course. I'll ask my colleague to get you a drink. Coffee? Yes, please. Milk and one sugar. Now, I suppose you'll need my name. Yes, Mr... Glass. William Glass. Double S. Do you have an email address, Mr. Glass? I do. It's wglass at email.com. I'll just fill in the date, 26th of February 2007. Right, what do you do, Mr Glass? I work at the Ministry of Culture. I'm a civil servant. How old are you? 29. And your marital status? I live with my girlfriend. Right, single. Do you have any children? No. And could I ask you how much you earn? Well, I'd rather not say, to be honest. Could you just look at these ranges and say where you fit in? Oh, OK. There, 24 to 36,000. OK, that's the personal information I need. Now I'd like to ask you about the property you live in. Do you live in a house or a flat, and how big is it? I live in a flat. About 100 square metres, a little under. Do you rent or is it yours? I have a mortgage. Now, you said that you were anticipating buying another home in the near future. Are you intending to get a house? Yes, I am. Just a small one. What's your budget like? Well, the bank has said that they'll allow me a mortgage of up to £100,000. So, enough for a small house. When you say a small house, what kind of size were you thinking? Oh, perhaps a little under 200 square metres with a garden of, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 square metres. And when do you think you'll buy the property? Within the next six months, hopefully sooner. Ah, here's your coffee. Thank you, John. Mr Glass, have you seen any particular properties that you are interested in? Yes, I have. There's an interesting development going on in the district of Hayden. The government has joined up with a private company to offer affordable housing there. It's on the outskirts of the city, but the transportation links look excellent. Regular buses to the underground station. That means that it will only take me an hour to get to work in the morning. Not much more than it takes now. They're going to have some nice facilities nearby too. Yes. I'm looking forward to the cinema complex and the shopping centre, of course. I love films and shopping will be convenient. There's a golf course nearby too. Well, I'm sure many of the other residents will appreciate it. I'll join the fitness centre instead. Is your company involved in the development in any way? Oh, my company just does research. However, the private developer involved in that project is our client. These smaller houses are about 180 square metres, which suits you perfectly. Yes, property is so expensive in this city nowadays. It's good that the government is beginning to help those of us who don't make large amounts of money. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to give you these free gifts. Oh, well, thank you very much. A notebook and a pen are always useful, and the T-shirt will come in useful in the summer. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You'll hear a lecture. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. Welcome everyone. My name is Pamela Stark and I'm here to tell you about international students and employment in this country. Let me start by stating the most important thing first. Your ability to work in this country while you're here as an international student depends on whether you are an EEA national, that is a European Economic Area national, not an EEA national with a stamp saying restriction on working in your passport, or not an EEA national with a prohibition on working stamp in your passport. Now, if you are an EEA national, you can work freely in this country. You can work for an employer or be self-employed. If your dependents, such as your spouse or children, come with you to this country, they can work here as well, no matter what their nationality. This is thanks to EEA rules, and these rules also mean that students from this country studying in other EEA member states can work freely too. Now, if you have come here for a course lasting more than six months, the immigration authorities automatically put a restriction on working in your passport. It is worded in the following way. Work and any changes must be authorised. This allows you to work under certain conditions. The first of these conditions is that during term time, you can work no more than 20 hours per week, but you can work longer if the work placement is an essential part of your course. For example, the work period of a sandwich course. The second condition is that you cannot run your own business, be self-employed, or work as a professional sports person or entertainer. The third condition is that you cannot take up a permanent full-time position, though you can do full-time short-term work during the holidays. If you are enrolled on a course lasting more than six months and you do not have this stamp, speak to an advisor at your institution immediately. Do not start work. It may be that a mistake has been made that needs to be corrected. However, if a mistake has been made, if you start work, you are breaking the law. This could have serious consequences for your future stay here. Another point that I would like to make is that even if you expect to be given a restriction on working, or already have one, you cannot include your earnings as evidence of your ability to support yourself financially. However, there are two exceptions to this rule. One is if you will be attending a publicly funded college or university, and the institution guarantees that it will employ you and can provide details of your pay. The other is, if you will be attending a sandwich course at a publicly funded college or university, and the institution guarantees that there will be a job for you and can provide details of your pay. In those two cases, you can include these earnings as evidence of your ability to support yourself. If you are from a country outside the EEA and your course in this country lasts six months or less, the immigration authorities are likely to have put a prohibition on working in your passport. It is worded as follows. No work or recourse to public funds. This means that you are not allowed to work at all while you are here. If you have come for a course of six months or less and want to be able to work, for example, because your course involves a work placement, you should have explained this when you applied for entry clearance or when you landed, if you did not get entry clearance in advance. If you have already been given a prohibition on working, you may be able to apply to have it changed. Ask the international officer or student advisor at your institution for advice. If you can provide evidence that you will be on a placement, your passport stamp will normally be changed. 
However, do not begin your placement before getting your stamp changed. Again, that is illegal and could affect your future studies in this country. Now, let's take a look at the situation if you are a non-EEA national and have brought your spouse or children with you. In that case, their passports will show the conditions that apply to them. They may be given either a prohibition on working, as explained above, this means they are not allowed to work, or they may have been given an entry clearance or stamp that does not mention employment at all. In this case, they are free to work in here without any limitations other than the right to start their own business. They will have been given this stamp if they have shown evidence that you, the student, have been given permission to be here for at least 12 months. Finally, let's take a look at working after your course ends. If you are a non-EEA citizen, until now the majority of non-EEA students have found it difficult to obtain permission to stay on in this country after their studies for work, apart from if they were training for a professional or specialist qualification before returning home. However, the government is currently reviewing its policies and some changes may be introduced that make it easier for students to stay on for work. You can find information about the current position if you click on Work Permits on the website listed on the leaflet I have given you. I should say that special provisions have always applied to doctors, dentists and nurses and these will continue. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 30. So, Jatinder and Ali, how did you deal with culture shock when you first came here to study? Well, Katerina, when I first arrived in the UK, I was just so excited to be living in a foreign country away from my parents that I just didn't really notice anything at first. How about you, Ali? Yeah, same here. That's quite typical, isn't it? Everything seems new and fascinating, but after this initial enthusiasm wears off, all the new experiences may begin to overwhelm you. Things that you found exciting at first may now seem strange and a little frightening. Even minor differences, such as being unable to buy your usual brands of various products, can add to the sense of strangeness. Yes, that's right. Then you may start to experience sudden mood changes and strong reactions, feeling lost, disoriented, and even irritated and resentful. Most of all, you may wish you were back among the familiar people and places at home. All international students can experience culture shock in some form, even those coming from countries with very similar lifestyles to those in the UK. It is important to understand that this reaction is entirely normal and that it will pass. OK, so what suggestions do you have for me? Well, I made sure that I arrived early. I got here about 10 days, yeah, 10 days before most of the other students, so that I could settle in before things got busy. Many universities run special induction programs for international students in the week before term begins. 
A typical induction program provides a tour of the college or university, an overview of its facilities and how to use them, help with registering for your academic program, and social events where you can meet other students and staff. This can help you to start to get used to your new environment. Yeah, I heard about those, but too late, unfortunately. Jatinda, did you go on an induction course like Ali? No, I wish I had, but my parents wouldn't let me go a day sooner than absolutely necessary. It was very annoying. Every university has counsellors who can give you practical advice on adjusting your new environment. These people have special training in offering advice and support, and they understand the challenges you face. They can listen to you sympathetically, offer practical suggestions, and refer you to other professionals if necessary. Your personal tutor and the staff in the international office of your college or university can also be helpful. Have you heard about the buddy or mentoring system? Students who have been at the university or college for a longer period give advice to new arrivals and are available for help and guidance throughout the year. There is information on schemes such as these at the Students' Union or the International Student Association will help you become involved. I used the system when I arrived and found it really opened some doors socially. You know, I got to meet lots of people. Like Ali, right? Right, Katerina. I think it's also important to keep in touch with home. Use the telephone, email, and conventional mail to keep in contact with your friends and family at home. In larger towns or cities with large international communities like this one, you may be able to find people from your country. Spend some time with them. Many international students find that it helps to make contact with people from a similar background. Because they understand what you're going through, spending time with people from your country can also be a relaxing break from the strangeness of the UK. You can speak your own language, eat your own foods, and talk about what is going on back home. Yes, and don't forget that the university has a variety of cultural societies, as well as an active international students' association. Ask at the student union. They may also have information about national or cultural groups outside the institution. Another thing you should try to do is to keep healthy and active. Make an effort to exercise regularly. You will feel better, and it can also be a good way to meet people. Eat a balanced diet and find a shop that sells food from your part of the world, so that you can enjoy familiar meals when you want them. That's a really good idea. I'll sign up at the university sports centre this afternoon. I don't know whether you believe in God, but if you do, remembering your faith can be helpful and comforting. If you follow a religion and worship regularly at home, you can keep this up while you're in the UK. It can provide a sense of stability and be a link to your life at home. Every major religion in the world is represented here. And most large cities have Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, and Buddhist centers, as well as synagogues and churches of all denominations. The student union keeps a list of places of worship. I'm not religious, but I do see your point. So there's plenty I can do, practical things, I mean. And above all, I need to remind myself that culture shock is normal and temporary. That's the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a presentation on an online course. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to this presentation on our online course, an introduction to electronics, which runs over ten weeks and starts on eighth of May. Let me just say at the beginning that if you cannot make this date, please send me an email about the next course, and I will send you a list of future dates. My email is the front of your brochures. Now, let me tell you something about the course. Based upon our popular two-day overview of electronics course, this new online course will introduce you to the basic ideas behind electronic circuits. The course will consist of ten units each, of which will involve around five hours of study. The course is designed to act both as an introductory course and as a refresher course. After taking the course, you should have a good idea of how electronic systems work and how they are made. In particular, the course focuses on the design of a hi-fi amplifier. The course is limited to analog electronics, where signals are represented by continuously variable voltages, and will not cover digital electronics, where signals are represented by discrete numbers. Students should normally have a reasonable proficiency in school maths and science. Study to GCSE level is sufficient for most of the course, though study to A level will enable a full understanding of the more advanced topics. Students on the course will be supplied with a copy of Terry Fitts' Fundamentals of Electronics. This will be used for directed reading, assignments, and further study. It also serves as a useful reference source. The student should have PC available and a basic knowledge of Windows in order to use the simulation software from the CD-ROM that comes with this book. Now, who is this course designed for? This course is intended for individuals with little prior knowledge of electrical or electronic engineering who want to get a feeling for the subject, and for individuals whose knowledge is rusty or out of date. A previous exposure to basic science and maths at school will be assumed. Maximum benefit will accrue to those who have attended higher education in a technical subject or who have experience in a related area. Typical attendees may include those in jobs which bring them into contact with electronics, such as drafts persons, PCB designers, production and assembly personnel, and software designers. Those working with electronic products. Such as managers and salespersons, those coming into electronics from a related field, such as scientists or mathematicians, and those simply curious to find out about this all-pervasive technology. The benefits of this course are that first, it gives you a quick insight into modern electronics. It also puts emphasis on practical devices and systems. Unlike many other courses, no prior knowledge is assumed. But previous exposure to school-level science and maths is assumed. Fourthly, it can be used as a refresher course. Fifth, there is the benefit of getting hands-on simulations, and finally, all delegates completing the course will receive a University of Oxford certificate of completion. The course will be presented by Brian Williams, who started his career working as an electronic engineer for British Aerospace. Brian then became a lecturer and has taught electronics at Oxford University and Jesus College for longer than he cares to admit. He is also an active consultant and researcher. Brian is a dynamic lecturer and particularly enjoys teaching introductory level courses and interacting with students. Now, finally, let me just quickly go through the course content. Please remember that this course is intended for individuals. With limited prior knowledge of electrical or electronic engineering, Unit One looks at electronic systems, including an introduction to the idea of signals represented by voltages, wires used to transfer signals and voltage from one place or box or component to another, and boxes or components manipulating voltages, particularly amplifying them. Unit Two takes a look at Ohm's law. The linear relationship of voltage and current, and the concept of resistance. It also looks at resistors and resistor networks. Unit three focuses on op amps. 
providing an introduction to the ideal op-amp and its applications. The next slide tells us that Unit 4 is concerned with capacitors and AC circuits. The theory and applications of capacitors and their use in transient and AC circuits. Unit 5 looks at frequency response and filters, including both passive and active filters. Unit 6 takes a look at magnetism, inductors and transformers. Looking at this next slide, we can see that Unit 7 covers RL and RLC circuits, including tuned filters and crossover networks. Unit 8 is entitled An Introduction to Semiconductors. It covers diodes and rectifiers, both theory and applications. This unit also looks at special purpose diodes. Unit 9 covers transistors, particularly bipolar transistors, including theory and typical circuits. The final unit, Unit 10, is a review unit with a little look at further applications. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test, the IELTS test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Thank you.